Welcome to another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits, there are no boundaries. This is off planet radio. Hey everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins, and Emily Moyer is with me. She's going to introduce our guests. Welcome to the show. The website is offplanetradio.com, and of course, our Patreon member site is patreon.com forward slash offplanetmedia. Welcome to the show, and hey, hello, Emily. Hi, how you doing? Nice to be back, Randy. I have, we've had a few weeks uh, apart, so always good to be back. And yeah, that's good. Have- we have one of our favorites, probably our favorite guest with us tonight. So here to uh, do a little election nonsense, since all he and I ever seem to talk about is nonsense anymore, right? Cabin nonsense, Q <laughs> nonsense, or whatever, right? So uh, we're going to do a little election nonsense. We're going to uh, get into the mess of the many different tiers of the secret space program industry and uh, do some astrology of the characters in it in the second hour. So uh, Robert Phoenix, good buddy. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Welcome back. Hey, it's to- great, great to be back with the two of you. Yeah. And uh, always a real treat to hang out with the Off Planet crowd. Getting some nice synergy with you two. So mm-hmm. thanks for having me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Feeling it tonight. Too. Little Kitty's joining us too. We just got a big meow. Yeah, Rosie's here. She's uh, getting involved. You know, doing her thing. <laughs> She's Rosie- through the vote. <laughs> So we do, this is my version of Olivia right here. I yeah. think people who know dark journalists has yeah. Olivia. Mm-hmm. I oh, have my, the lovely Rosie. There my she cat, is. my cat's na- my cat is actually named Olivia. She's oh, over here. That's too weird. Let's, let's get the Olivia. Hold on. Come that on. is too weird. <laughs> We're going down. The, oh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Right there, man. Oh, who's that? Bring that hey, cat hey, back man. up there. Let's introduce the two cats. Olivia, right that's here. Rosie. Rosie. Oh, yeah, Rosie. Yeah, oh. these are these yeah. are the secret. Oh, space Olivia cats. sees Rosie. These are these are the <laughs> these are the secret space cats here, right? Wow, hey, Randy, is that a first or off planet? <laughs> is that a what? Is that a first or off planet? I think so. The cat to cat thing. Yeah, the the cat, cats that's, got, the that's got to be a first. Yeah, my cat has been on the show before, but not with another cat. So we can actually probably post this under cat videos, and we might get some extra views. There you go. We can put it on Facebook. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I did that, I, you know, I, I would post the, you know, what I thought was a really good article on my website. Yeah. I post it on Facebook. I might get ten likes. <laughs> then I posted Jasper, Jasper talking about how much he liked my post, and I got like seventy likes. Right. <laughs> how much you liked my 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 article? So, you know, yes. when in doubt, yeah. pimp the cat out. Face it. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's the explanation for the blue chicken cult is that nobody likes people, but they like animals, even if they're blue alien animals. We're just here holding <laughs> space for them until they ascend. <laughs> that's it. We, we, you know, the Barb, you, you guys have read Barbara Marciniak, right? Yes, absolutely. The I haven't. Randy loves her. I love her. Well, I, the first book I think is brilliant. Like Bringers yeah. of the Dawn, I think that's is. It. Bringers of the Dawn is. is total brilliant. classic. Like, it what is. was it came out of Earth or something like that, Randy? Yeah. Yeah, and it was okay, but Bringers of the Dawn is like a mind blower. And I saw I saw Barbara Marciniak kind of at her peak during that Bringers of the Dawn phase, doing a live channel in channeling in San Francisco. Um, and the, the the theater was packed, and it was so unbelievably cold inside the theater. It was weird. Like, you know, I bet that they either had a, like a waiver that Marciniak had to turn the heat down or, but it was really chilly inside that. And it was a really nice theater, you know, but um, one of the things, you know, that she talks about this, she talks about cats yeah. being cameras. Yes. Mm. And that they're linked to what is it? Is it Lyra, the planet Lyra or and what is Lyra. one of those? That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So cat cats are actually part of the, another secret space program, right? I, so I was right. Are you there? There you go. The it's a secret space, space pussy 
program, the SSP. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's the secret space kitty we police thing, the right? Lesbian, they're, they're, it's the SSPP, the pussy program. Right, but it's also it's also the kitty cat police state, right? Because they're cameras and they're surveilling us. They are, but I think I think it's I think it's good. I think it's I think it's good. <laughs> yeah, basically, like they're overseers. Well, I like I, go ahead. Totally Both Rock Castaldo and I have talked about uh, maybe not even on the air. I don't know about experiences each of us have had with seeing these sort of mm, almost like cat kind of creatures at musical events, right? Like out of the corner of your eye, like I was at this party in downtown LA and in the alley, this group of people came in and when I would look at them out of the corner of my eye, they looked like cat people, like almost like from the play Cats, right? When I would turn and look at them head on, they looked normal. But out of the corner of my eye, they had like, you know, a cat, like a shape-shifting kind of thing going on. And it made me think about, you know, it was, it was in an alley and I made me think about the play Cats. My cousin was in the play Cats. And I went and I looked it up and like, that I think actually was some of the inspiration for T.S. Eliot writing that is he had had these visions of these cat people in an alley, yeah. you know, in London. Like the movie Cat People too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, and there's two versions of cat people. There's the yeah. old version with Natasha the black Kinsky, and white version, right? and then there's the remake with yeah. uh, Nastasia Kinsky. Nastasia, yeah, yeah, yeah Nastasia. Very hot, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's something there, right? There's something there to this shape shifting. Mm -hmm. sort of lore around people and cats, which I, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I Another great shape-shifting movie. We'll get to the election. But have you guys ever that's, seen... Well, that's Wolf a shape-shifting movie, too. Have you seen... Have you seen... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> have, you, have you seen Wolfen with Albert Finney? No. No. Oh, man. Wolfen is one of my favorite films of all time. And it's, it's got everything. It's got conspiracy... It's got the elites. It's got Edward James Olmos as a shape-shifting oh, wolf. I mean, and it is brilliant. It is. It's one of my favorite films of all time. And highly recommend it. Wolfen. It, there you go. I remember when that movie came out. I just never saw it. No, uh, it's 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 terrific. And uh, Albert Finney, you know, he he played um, this character in Beneath the Volcano, you know, Malcolm Lowry uh, yep. novel. And he, in that movie, he, he plays an alcoholic, which I don't think was that hard for Albert Finney to play. No, actually. I don't but, think so either. Yeah, he has kind of a, a replay of that as a as a lawyer inside of this movie Wolfen, and um, it's just is it though it, I don't want to give it away. Just go watch it. It's a great film. Yeah. All righty. There you go. You get politics, film reviews, cat stories, the whole thing. This right. is off planet. Yeah. We just got started, right? Yeah, we just <laughs> fired up the film. We got, we got, we got a few hours ago. Absolutely. We do. All right, let's let's hit the uh, the real shape shifting movie, the elections. What say you, Robert? What does it look like? Well, I mean, clearly, I I think there's going to be a bloodshed, and I, and I think that. Um, that the Republicans are going to clean, they're going to clean up. And I could be completely wrong. Obviously, there's always something that can happen, but there's just too many signs. And I haven't even gotten into the chart yet, but there are just too many signs that are indicating that there are a number of people who are swapping their votes out. And this is a statistic that I've quoted on my show recently on a number of occasions where in the state of Wyoming, from July 1st to September 6th, they had 12,000 people change their voter affiliation and registration. And out of those 12,000 people, it was like 11,600 became Republicans. So if, if that's any indicator of where the country is going, it's going to be a bloodbath. Um, and I think that the Republicans are going to clean up. You may have a few governors that might sneak in. Um, but I don't think it's going to be close, and uh, that's where our story gets both so this interesting is be, and interested. This is going to be sort of like uh, election eve, election night 2000. Just go in there. I have something to bring up related to that. Go ahead, Randy. Yeah. No, it's going to be one of those where I think you're going to wake up in the morning amazed at the groundswell like they did with Trump when that, that moment around 1 a.m. Eastern time when the line on the chart at CNN went like this and it didn't stop. And all of a sudden, everything Hillary had at that point was blotted out. 
it was very clear something happened there in space and time that was just it was supernatural and i'm kind of seeing that with this where there's a groundswell but people aren't talking about it there's a lot of closet converts out there right now because quite frankly the democrats have completely mismanaged their own tactical teams they have overplayed this so badly that they've alienated what would have been their own particular groundswell. I think they could have turned this if they had played this prudently, but they've mismanaged it for 16 months. So this is a really good point you bring up, Randy. And one of the things that I talked about on my show today was that, is this possibly intentional? You know, mm-hmm. are, are we looking at collusion at a really high level? Mm-hmm. So, like, and I thought about this. Why did Elizabeth Warren, two weeks out from My the election, do, do that stupid stunt with DNA.com or Ancestry.com and basically step in a pile of buffalo do mm-hmm. and make herself look ridiculous? I mean, aren't these people brighter than that? Right. The, you know, the Democrats are supposed to be the intellectual party. Yeah. And, 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 and it feels to me like that's either extremely miscalculated, like Randy has, has mentioned, or there's some kind of intent mm-hmm. behind looking and acting and appearing this way. And what's happened because of all these antics, the shenanigans, the, um, you know, the, the, the stuff that happened with the Supreme Court, I mean, the Democrats have looked awful, and they've forced people over to the Republican That was a complete party. shit show. And totally. what they tried to do there, and my opinion was, that was not an accident. Bringing forward someone who was claiming rape that far back in time with no prior disclosure and attempting to torpedo a Supreme Court judge, much like just exactly what they did with Clarence Thomas, and it blew back on them then. So this is an old tactic. But I I also see how both sides were complicit in minimizing the visibility of actual issues related to Kavanaugh's nomination, something that we talked about a couple of weeks ago on the show, which Mm -hmm. masks some agendas that sit in the background, including this whole issue about tribunals, which was an actual line of questioning that came up, but was completely sidelined over the rest of the the sex debacle. So the Democrats have done a horrible job. The Republicans appear to almost be like springboarding off of everything they do. And you have to wonder after a while if somebody isn't paying attention to the physics that's occurring inside of public opinion and all this. Yep. The the other uh, question I had, Robert, is when we sat here and did this almost exactly two years ago, before the presidential election, a figure that, you know, was actually quite important in that was James O'Keefe. And we've been seeing him pound out the videos again the last couple of weeks. How much do you think some of this footage that he has caught has, has damaged, you know, because some of these local and state news you know, organizations have really been reporting on it. Do you think that some of this stuff that he's been doing has really been damning for them. And then my other question is, at this point, the Democrats, they can't stand him so much and they think what he does is wrong. Why haven't they gotten their own version of James O'Keefe to go in and do this on the Republican side? Maybe you're right. Maybe this is, you know, a collusion and they're trying to bring down the Democratic Party intentionally. Yeah, you know, first of all, I think the O'Keefe stuff at this point is probably minimal. Ah, okay. Uh, maybe maybe with a, with a candidate like... Um, the governor of uh, Florida, mm-hmm. you know, that, that might make a difference mm-hmm. on some level because have what you seen that video like- with that, that Haitian guy? It's just yeah. like, I mean, the Haitian guy is kind of interesting, you know, he's like being just incredibly honest about the whole thing. Uh, Gillum is, is that the governor? Yeah. I mean, that, that might make a difference. What about uh, like with McCaskill or, or Donnelly or some of the, uh, well, McCaskill certainly might um, here in Texas. I don't think Beto. Beto really stood much of a chance. Um, so I'm not sure how much of a difference that's going to make. I think that probably the bigger issue is the collusion mm-hmm. 
uh, with money and sort of the, you know, what, whoever, whatever Soros is mm-hmm. you know, tied into this migrant wave and which I talked, you know, Soros is, is partnering with, with MasterCard, you know, he's doing this thing called human ventures. So they're setting up a line of credit for, you know, quote unquote migrants when they come into this country. And so, yeah. Oh yeah. So he's already got it. I haven't heard this. I talked about this today because, you know, one of the things that's interesting, we can get into some of the astrology around this in the second hour is that I, you know, we, we often think that it's government that is taking on sort of the commercial or, or the, the corporate entity and, and merging with it and, you know, creating this fascist state, right? which is the basic fa- definition of fascism. But I've been watching commercials lately, and commercials and corporations are becoming much more political. Mm-hmm. And they're becoming kind of parties and, and even sort of political zones unto themselves. It's the corporate neo-Marxism you and I talked about last week. Yeah, but, it, but it's coming now from, not from the Both government sides. side. Right. Right. But it's coming from the corporate, the corporate side. Yeah, the corporate. And the corporate yeah. side is saying, well, we can compete with government now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because we, we the have the eyes, we have the money, um, we have the, the advertising budgets. Mm-hmm. We think we have the keys to get into uh, people's psyche under the age of 35. And all the while hiding the fact that the government itself already is a corporation. Absolutely. This is completely lost on anybody who's pulling levers tomorrow is that they yeah. do not know that they are voting for officers of corporations. It doesn't matter what level of office. Right. These are all corporations. And if they would go and they would look at the CAFR information, the Comprehensive Annual Financing Reports that came out years ago, they would see exactly the stream of money and how government is really funded on the back end. I mean, yeah, I, it's not lost on me that for all the genius of what Catherine Austin Fitz has done, that has gotten lost in, in the bandwidth somewhere. The concept that they're running two sets of books at every level of government. That's right. California has always been one of these states where the CAFR um, sort of disjunction uh, has been sort of the most egregious mm-hmm. and the most um, visible in a lot of ways. And you could look at those books because the state is crying poor all the time. Mm-hmm. But in actuality, Billions the state is filthy rich. Yeah. And they have deep pockets and deep investments. And you're absolutely right. And I, you know, and I talked about that today. I mean, the United States is a corporation, right? Mm-hmm. But now you have corporations, you know, fic- you know fictions, right? Personal mm-hmm. fictions, corporations that are now competing with the corporate known as well, the United States of America. Google is basically the world government. Well, it, it ha- certainly has, it has w- one of the tentacles. I think there are a number of tentacles. Yeah. And it's a tentacle. But, um, but what, again, what I was trying to share with today was with this whole thing around Soros and human ventures and that they're really just trying to create kind of a new system or a variant of systems inside of an existing system. So it's a, it's an interesting phenomenon to watch. I don't know if you've seen the uh, the latest Levi commercial. Have you seen that commercial? Mm-mm. It just started running over the past few days, and it's a fascinating commercial in that there's no dialogue. It's all cinema verite. Mm. Uh, it's shot incredibly well. Um, the light is you know kind of low or natural, and there are various kinds of scenarios going on, and it all has to do around uh, people voting. Right, mm-hmm. and the symbols are fascinating. Uh, one of the one of the characters in this voting experience is a woman in a burqa. You know, and now this is starting to show up even more yep. in in video in commercials. If you look at the Nike video with Kaepernick, yeah. clearly there's a woman in a burqa. Girl, she's, she's a she's a uh, what do you call that when they fight with the stick? She's um she won the silver medal. Fencer. She won the silver. I can't remember her name. But she has an yeah. So name. so yeah. you've got the you've got the woman in the burqa there. Yeah. There's a woman in a burqa voting. There's a woman who is voting, and she's got that classic '70s styles fro, throwback. You know, echoes kind of subtly of you know black power, black empowerment. There are people on a bus. They're on a bus, okay, and they're going to vote. 
and who knows where the hell that bus is, where it's coming from, where it's going. But clearly, it's a bus, and it, it is it is not a very slick or fancy charter bus. Mm -hmm. Then there's part of this montage are these guys like it looks like they're they're in a you know a, a part of Soweto. I kid you not, and they're walking around on crutches and. And then there's like the one kind of normal sort of American theme where there's a, a young guy and a father and the kid's got an earring and there's tension between him and the father. And, and you know, clearly it's a grassroots sort of take, but you know, you know that kid's not going to vote the same way as the father. I mean, that's the message. So I'm like, okay, well, what's going on here? And, and, and at the end of that commercial, Levi's is – basically telling people to go out and vote. What mm -hmm. you don't see in that video is you don't see outside of the father whose vote's going to get canceled out by, you know, who knows, <laughs> his earring wearing, maybe queer son. You know, you don't see like, <laughs> grassroots Americans. And in fact, some of the scenes don't even look American. So what's up with that? You know, so it's like there's this, are they going to be voting in downtown Lesotho? I mean, well, this, this is, is the new America. This is the, the demographic wet dream that's been dreamed up by Madison Avenue to create a composite that's identifiable and segmentable. This is yeah. marketing at its finest. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And, and it's like, okay, well, great. Um, I'm not in that commercial. You're nope. not in that commercial, Randy. Nope. You're not in that commercial, Emily. Mm -mm. And it and and it's just well, I, it's, I, I I don't vote, so I would never. Be no, I, I get it. I know I, I get that. But but whatever you might represent, right? Yeah. You're not there, and and the, and Randy's right on point. But it's but the whole idea is that the voting has to do with something that is beyond borders. Mm -hmm. And we're watching. I'm watching these things pop up. Right. That's one. Kaepernick commercials. The other. And then there was this other commercial that Johnny Walker Black did about a year ago with a band called um, Chicano Batman. Do you know this group? I think they're from LA. Mm -mm. Anyway, um, they're pretty well known. And, you know, there are these Latino guys and they play this kind of, you know, Latin rock fusion thing. And Johnny Walker Black did a commercial with them about a year ago, which I had not seen. And trust me, I watch a, I watch a lot of TV, especially sports. And the commercial is the band, they're sitting on a rooftop they just had their little Johnny Walker black tipple, although you don't see them drinking. They get up off this rooftop and they start to hit the streets of LA and they start playing, this land is your land, this land is my land. So they do Woody Guthrie and it's, you know, quote unquote Chicano-fied and it's about walking, right? Walking. And it's Johnny Walker black, you know, keep walking, moving. I mean, it's like, why, why is this commercial airing you know, a week, really a week. It's a, a year old. They started to get a heavy rotation. With the migrant, about the migrant the, caravan. The election. And then there's the caravan happening. Well, and isn't there, like, I saw in Tucker Carlson last week that there's, like, there's, like, a lawsuit being filed on behalf of the people in the caravan saying that it's unconstitutional not to let them into the country or, or to try and stop the caravan. So you have people who are not U.S. citizens who are outside of the U.S. state, the United States, trying to say that, something is unconstitutional. It was just sounding crazy. You know what I'm talking about? I do know what you're talking about. And, you know, there's very specific language. Mm -hmm. Like the, the people that set up the, the current immigration laws were Reagan and the, and the two Bushes. You know, especially, especially the first Bush. Mm -hmm. Basically set everything up to where, what, what we are now experiencing and made it very, very easy. And there's specific and particular language in there um, that if they wanted to, they could probably get some kind of legal plank on. So, and I, and I actually heard one of the attorneys go into great detail, bored the hell out of me, but I had to listen uh, because, you know, apparently it's an important thing. Well, where is, where is Homeland Security in all of this when I can't get through an airport without being strip searched literally anymore, being x-rayed to hell, my bags torn apart, things confiscated from me and all kinds of facial recognition and, and, and scrutinization of me, somebody who has rarely stepped foot off of this continent. And yet we have marches coming up 
from Latin America onto the border, defying us to enforce our own boundaries. I mean, and, and, and I saw the video of Trump yesterday. He's very adamant about this. He says he's putting 15,000 troops on the border, along with the agents that are already down there from ICE and all the other agencies. But the point is, it's almost like a dare right now. It's like, because Trump's president, they're going to do this. And it looks staged to me. It, do, it, it, do, it, it truly does look staged. I, I would agree with that. This is a John Wayne move if I ever saw one. It's a dick move in terms of, you know, basically building on one side the oppressed minority struggling towards the border, you know, emaciated and unshaven and, and haggard. And the family's been left in the background when these men struggle to get to the border. And there's Trump, a white guy in a black suit with a red tie, basically going, no way, he ain't coming across the line. This right. Is they're, they're, you know, he's going to build like Trump City with yeah. all these tents. <laughs> and, and, you know, at, at what time does Trump City become a concentration camp? Uh, of or course. A camp? Probably overnight. It's back to, just as a sideways for a minute, to point people back, what we talked about a couple of shows ago about the tribunals and why this may be an issue and how having somebody like Kavanaugh on the court placing three Jesuit-trained Roman Catholics there operating under canon law, this goes... My interview with Sister Carrie Burner goes into this too, because I think there are players in the background that have not really been revealed, and their historical position hasn't been talked about a whole lot, but they're the players that have been there since 1861. And we're, we're now starting to see something, we're starting to see something stage out again. We haven't seen in our lifetime or the lifetimes of our parents or grandparents. Yeah, I, 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 you're, I think you're right. And uh, getting back to this point you brought up about, like, Homeland Security and TSA and, you know, all the stuff that theoretically we have to go through, and then looking at this other um, reality, right? It's almost like it's a dark alchemy in some ways. Mm -hmm. and, and a total Operation Mindfuck, and that here are these people... Um, well, they're more free than you are. They get more shit than you do. Um, they're more privileged than you are. You know, get back in the line and, you know, take your pants off as you go go through security. I don't think that that's um, unintentional. I think that that's actually... Oh, no, this is shaming, humiliation. It is designed to put you in a powerless position. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And this gets back into that segmentation you were talking about. Yeah. In terms of Madison Avenue marketing. And, you know, I always like, you know, for me, like Anthony Sutton is, is sort of like the yeah. Moses mm -hmm. of the world that we're living in. And one of the things that Sutton, you know, really got into was the relationship between the elites uh, through skull and bones. Yeah. And he was very clear that for every conservative, there was a liberal counterpart inside of skull and bones and that it didn't matter kind of where they moved whatever it is that they wanted to move because it would represent you know their faction their group and ultimately their reality so when we when we see what's taking place with this left and right thing how do you how do you even define conservative and republican in the 21st century because to me the Democratic Party that I would have traditionally identified with as a young idealistic punk growing up in the late 60s and early 70s would have been the party of Hubert Humphrey and people like that, not so much Lyndon Johnson, but the party that was viewed as being to the left in terms of social justice, left in terms of economic advancement, civil rights, all of the things that we could agree that came out of the 60s at that time, the anti-war movement, they were actually positive. That party's gone. What the Democrats became was largely neocons with blue suits. And then the Republicans have been edging ever closer and with Trump seem to have jumped the shark over now into a neoliberal camp. So that we're, we're, we're heading towards fascism, but it's not fascism Mussolini style. 
It's fascism it was a different twist in terms of how it's going to be presented because it's corporatism, but it's corporatism through the filter of government, much like what you were saying. And it's I'm not sure. It's Marxism. It's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it yeah, isn't I mean, Marxist I, I, anymore. The Marxist yeah. ideology is all stripped out of this because you can't sell that in the United States. Yeah, right. that's, that's actually a great point. You know, I, I think what happened with you know, the, the Democrats you're talking about is that their power really dissipated um, when the unions began to lose that their, was their power base. Yes. Yeah. And what and once the corporations began to move their operations overseas, um, the, you know, whatever unions were left were clearly um, not that they were not that manageable and they lost membership. They lost numbers. You know, my father, my father was a teamster. Sure. And yeah. the teachers were, you know, died in the wool, committed to the Democratic Party. Absolutely. Yeah. I and, 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 and then, and then you know, my, the company my father worked for, you know, the unions were too strong in, in, in the, the Bay Area. They wanted to move into Tennessee. And then after that, Tennessee got too pricey and off to Korea they went, you know. Yeah. I mean, that typifies what happens. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that when that happened, I think that the Democrats – at a high level, became internationalists and globalists, like their Republican counterparts. Yep. And, and Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and uh, the Democratic Mafia, uh, that was really at the, kind of the zenith of power in the 90s, typified that. You know, Ron Brown, another guy, you know, who, who came out of that, that you know, world, you know, cl close to unionization and workers' rights and you know, Ron Brown died in a plane crash. Well, with a bullet in his head, unfortunately. Well, the, yeah, well, that whole plane went down. Remember that? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You and know, they, they, they basically switched the transponder signal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, sla they slammed into that mountain. Plane, basically, for Ron yeah, they, they, yeah, and they were going over to the Balkans so they could all cut business deals. Yeah. And, and Ron Brown knew where all the bodies were buried. And it was a great way to take out a bunch of competition and silence somebody who theoretically had, you know, some real inside baseball on the Clintons. Uh, you know, yeah. that was a really weird thing. And nobody really, you know, some people got into that, but it wasn't one of those things that was really exhumed, let's put it that way. Yeah, well, it was, it was added to the Clinton body count, but it was never really examined as being part of a, a, a much larger uh, thing that was going on there. So, Could you imagine if that had happened now with the Internet? Like that thing. Yeah, right. yeah, that was a lot of why it escaped notice. I mean, you didn't have the analysts on the internet that you have now. Yeah. You know, unfortunately for Hillary, the voices out there that echoed the the the, the shock about the Clinton Clinton Foundation and then Peter, you know, Peter Gate, Pizzagate, and all the things that spun off of that made it indeterminately hard for her to maintain a public posture without it somehow ricocheting off of her. So, and it seems to have happened to the entire party now. Oh yeah. You know, they're, they're just, and again, you know, you look at, you know, the, the sort of the, the playbook, the internationalist and the elite playbook, it doesn't really matter if they're left or right. And to your point the the Republicans have moved sort of right, you know, left more to the left and more back into the center, theoretically, theoretically. And I think I think Steve Bannon um, has a lot of um, the. I think he had a lot to do with that. Whether or not uh, Trump decided to stay, you know, with his uber populist movement, you know, Bannon 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 is like a Democrat at heart. I mean, mm -hmm. he really is a Democrat yeah, at heart. Yeah. And you know, he grew up in Norfolk, Virginia. You know, went through the Navy. And the guy, the guy's a blue collar kid through and through. Made a bunch of money with Goldman Sachs. Um, and I think that he's trying to typify the voice. He's going to have a big year. So shifting a little bit to astrology, Steve Bannon is going to have a big year. This is going to be the comeback year of Steve Bannon. Watch. You just watch. Everything that Bannon talked about, got vilified for, became uh, a poster child for racism, white nationalism, fascism, which I don't think he is, by the way. But it's an easy, it's an easy target. He's going to wind up this year looking like a prophet. This is going to be Steve Bannon's year. I was watching a little bit of, of a debate. It's, there's a Canadian series called The Monk Debates. 
that yep. are quite interesting. I, I was watching a little bit of a debate from the other night of Steve Bannon versus David Frum. And David Frum, who has classically been thought of as a Republican, was representing a liberal position and Steve Bannon a populist position. And one of the st things that Steve Bannon said, and he said it very convincingly, and I believed him, is we will have a populist future. The only question is whether it will be a populist national nationalist future or a populist socialist future. And I thought that was a very interesting point. Those are the two choices we're given? That's, I mean, that, well, that, that no. you know, I'm not saying that I think he's necessarily right, but I thought it was very interesting. So David Frum is, is representing a liberal position, which really was coming off more as a globalist position, right? So it's basically, because right. there's a degree, you know, socialism is on a certain, you know, on a certain level, Bernie Sanders is kind of a nationalist. It's just a different kind, right? So, you know, socialism, a lot of socialism is, socialism is more nationalist, but he was basically saying that either we're going to have a Bernie Sanders style of populism or we're going to have a Steve Bannon style of populism, but it's going to be populism one way or another. And I thought it was an interesting point. Well, again, astrologically, I would tend to agree with that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're winding down, even though, we're, you know, we, we really, we're going to hit that mother load moment in February, January, February of 2020 with the... Uh, Pluto Saturn conjunction, but we're wind, we're winding down with Pluto and Capricorn, and within um, five to six years, you know we're going to be in Pluto and Aquarius, and when that happens, you know we are moving towards some kind of collectivity, we're moving towards some kind of you, you know populist um, you know ideology slash reality. And I think Bannon's right. And, you know, I, you, know, you know, we talked about this, Randy, you and I on Facebook, we talked about that pincer effect, yep. you know, where the left and the right, you know, sort of come in. It's a military tactic and it basically squeezes you in the center and moves you to one side or the other, right? And, and it feels to me like, you know, it has been for a while that we're either going to get the neoliberal version of social Marxism or we're going to get the neo-fascist version of nationalism. And not a lot of choice in between. These are the two models that are going to be, be offered up. And, um, you know, I'm not sure which one is going to be the more oppressive. I think they both have equal amounts of oppression just expressed or, do or distributed. Even what, do we even know at this point what populism would look like in that time span, given the demographic we talked about earlier and how they are basically remolding the American image right now. I mean, the Joe Lunchbox is gone. You know, the guy in the, in, in the jumpsuit, the flannel suit, they, they, these are start archetypes of Western civilization that have, are now disappearing into a melting pot. And that melting pot is a cauldron of different affinity groups and ethnic mixes, much like the woman in the burqa. What yeah. represents populism now could look like a whole lot of things, including Sharia law in some form. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's you, where I see that going. Yeah, no, you, you bring up a really valid point. And, um, you know, I, I think we have to look at sort of, you know, who's on the roll and rising now. Yeah. So we look at millennials and millennials it's easy to like typify millennials and put them in one kind of camp and category and just say, you know, it's a patch of snowflakes. And that's not really true. No, it's not true. Um, I think that there are a lot of millennials that are really switched on. Um, they realize that the game is bullshit. Um, and they're, they're, they don't have a lot of alternative models. You see, that's the problem is that, when if we go back say to the 1950s you know the, there there were models for us to be able to embrace one model was that you could get a job with a reasonable amount of training that job would pay you well enough That's right. and you could actually raise a family just by having that job okay part of that model also was the religious social and moral training that went along with christianity as an organizing principle those two were hand in glove in the middle part of the 20th century. And then the 1960s and then the 70s come along and everything gets fragmented. In the 60s, it's that organizing principle of religion 
that gets atomized. And then the 70s, it's what happens to the workforce. And the workforce begins to get dissipated and redistributed through, through globalism. So now you've got a group of people, young people, that have no model, really. They're burdened with student debt, up to their third eyes in student debt. Um, many of them raised in split families by their mothers. Well, not, a, not, a lot of, not a lot of male modeling the around. Their own generation as well. Yeah. yeah. And wow. so, so they're, okay, so what's going to happen to these people? You know, where, where are they going to, you know, the, the interesting thing about the Pluto and Scorpio kids, because that's the millennials, is that they will go through things intensely and that they'll go through things all the way to the end. And there's a great potential for transformation with this generation. Mm -hmm. Really great. Their challenge is that, again, we're dealing with outer planets. They've got Neptune and Capricorn and Uranus and Capricorn. And Capricorn represents the father in the chart represents father, governing principles, corporations, big business. And so they have these two planets, both of which can be fairly unstable when it relates to these principles. Like Uranus wants to blow shit up, right? Uranus wants to turn things over. Neptune feels lost, can feel abandoned, adrift. You're not connected with, you know, kind of a greater plan in some ways. Yeah. So where we are now with Saturn and Capricorn, it's going to, it's going to conjunct generationally, they're Neptune and they're Uranus. It's also going to sextile their Pluto. So this is actually a very interesting time for millennials. And we might see a tidal shift with them. And it may, they may have looked like one group, say, three or four years ago. And they may look very different three or four years from now. And I can't tell you kind of where they're going to go or what it's going to look like. But I do have one interesting statistic is that the millennials that are marrying um, are, are divorcing a lot less. So when they bond and they're together, they stay together. Now, whether they have children or not, I don't know. That's a whole other thing. I know a lot of millennials that are choosing not to have kids. That's exactly been, yeah. Or they're having one and they're very deliberate about it. Right. And they're also more circumspect about the system itself. I mean, they're not a boisterous generation. They're not politically active overall. But in private conversations, I look, I've got kids that are millennials. I know what they think. And they're, they basically, their thinking is, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to build my life. I'm going to do it with the least amount of friction possible, which includes, in a lot of cases, basically being anarchists in exile much like Emily and I are in terms of we keep things kind of at this distance, which means we're not activists, but at the same time, we're very aware of the mechanisms of the government, how it functions, and how you duck and dodge all that, which makes for at some point a generation that if they get a significant updraft, they have the ability to galvanize into something that would look starkly different than previous political activist movements we've seen. It would be a resistance, but it's a resistance in action and not in ideology. That's just my assessment of it. Yeah, I think it's a good one. You know, I, I, you know, I've, I do readings for millennials and, um, and I have a few students that are millennials. And I'll share a story with you about a young man uh, who helped me produce my, uh, my astrology video, live with me for six months and Millennial kid got to know him. We work together, and he's he's become a born again Christian. Now that is a Pluto and Scorpio kind of deal, right? You know, Scorpio is extreme. So he he you know he he's become somebody who's involved in this church now, um, and feels great about it. Now he's a Pisces, so he's got some he's got some traction in that world. But clearly, it indicates the type of deep personal transformation that millennials are capable of. It's going to be interesting, you know, because uh, if, we look, if we go out 30 years from now, it's like a lot of the people who built the systems that we're living in are going to be gone. They're going to be gone. You know, the Pluto and Cancer people, the boomers, they're going to be gone. And who's going to be running the world? Who's going to be running the machinery? Who's going to be fixing things? You know, there's a whole, like, legacy and generation of men, some women, 
you know, who were engaged in the operations and the mechanics of kind of running the country, running the world, power plants. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Who's and who's going to do those things? Is it going to be AI? Is it going to be robots? I mean, is that what's going to happen? Because there's a whole group of people that are migrating out of this domain. And it's going to be very interesting to see how things are maintained, worked with, and operated 30 years from now. It's going to be very fascinating to watch. The group before, the after the millennials, and that's my son's age. They range from around 22 to about 12. And I'm, I'm not sure where they're going. This is the iGen. Huh? The iGen. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where they're going. You know, they're very different in terms of like their their attire tends to be sporty. They wear a lot of gym shorts. They're very into like athletic trends. You know, if you go back to when the millennials were growing up, they dressed up like yuppies, right? They were that a yuppie look when they were kids. These kids aren't like that. They're kind of ready for action. Um, and I'm not sure where they are politically yet. I know for a fact that, you know, the Pied Piper of Broward County uh, tried to round them up and get them to vote. Uh, and, and I think that there <laughs> you mean, was... You mean, you mean Mr. Ho Mr. Hogg? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Hogg man. So I, I, think, I think that there was some interesting kind of energy, not that I would support it, but, you know, they're Sagittarians and they feel very strongly, Pluto and Sagittarius very strongly about truth and issues and so it'll be and they're very philosophical so we'll see what happens with them the younger generation before them which just started to come onto the scene in 2009 so right now these kids are going to be about nine years old and younger these kids are interesting oh, here comes jasper these kids are interesting they're, Hi, pluto, they're pluto and capricorn kids and they're all, they're like all old souls and you, you sit around and watch any kid between the age of two and nine, and I guarantee you, you will trip out. Like, they're very advanced, mm -hmm. very, they're very, very self-aware, and given, given some uh, instruction and, some, and some, some, some learning, I mean, you, I could easily see these kids running, running companies by the age of 16 and 17. They could do it. Some of them will be able to do it. They're going to be super interesting. The other thing I was thinking about, you know, they're Pluto and Capricorn. And <clears throat> one of the images of Capricorn is Baphomet, right? Mm -hmm. Baphomet. And when we look at Baphomet, we see this kind of unisex being. Androgynous, yeah. And, yeah. And these are the mm -hmm. kids, nine and younger, who are kind of on this program mm -hmm. you know, in terms of their, their identity. And so that's a whole other interesting kind of, mythology that they're going to have to go through and play out. Some of the Pluto and Sag kids have that as well, by the way. They're, you know, it's, it's not like completely a Pluto and Capricorn copyright. But, uh, I, you know, going back to your original premise, Randy, about what this populism is going to look like, I, 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 have, I have no clue. I have absolutely no clue. And... Clearly, there is an effort to get into the hearts and minds and pocketbooks of these young people in order to lead them into a particular type of social program, which they probably have crooked on the back burner somewhere, or at least two or three versions of it. And, and Nike's leading the way in this. Nike's a big part of it. Yeah. Nike's huge. You know, Nike has a shitload of money. Mm -hmm. so, but Nike's very, very powerful. And Amazon is really powerful, even though I don't think Am I, no, I think Amazon makes it. YouTube doesn't make the profit. You know, but we look at some of these entities, and they're they're, you know, they're powerful. And Nike's got big time deep pockets, mm -hmm. so you know they can they could kind of move move things around if they if they are are motivated. And it clearly, seems like they're motivated. Did we get to where we needed to be on this hour? We never do. We always go someplace totally different. No, we do. We need to look at the election. We need to look at the election. It's all good. Let's 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 look let's look at the election. I mean, you look you look you looked at it a little bit, but let's look let's finish the election part in this segment, yeah. and we'll move on to the the SSPP. Okay, because we started off with the election and, and the, the process, right? I mean, that's where it all began. So yeah. I'm gonna 
I'm going to share a little screen at here. All righty. We can look at the chart. Sorry, I kind of took off there and just. No, it was great. Went on a little thing. All right, hold on. Let me move this up if I can. There we go. All right, so this is election night. This is the chart for election night. And it is, um, you can see it's November 6th. It's 11 p.m. So this is when most of the action has already occurred, mm -hmm. theoretically. And I, you know, I've run, I ran three different charts earlier on. I did a show with Robert Bonamo. And um, there were three different phases and stages of election night. This is the sort of the denouement, and it's not a it's not a great one. The whole thing but, is in one side of the chart. Okay. Yeah. So for sure, right? It's all over between the fourth house and yeah. uh, the, the cusp of the ninth house or the midheaven. This is a classic bull chart in astrology, and I don't want to get too deep into the meaning of it, but clearly there is a very strong emphasis from here to here, but also the open spaces mean mean something too. The unoccupied space. So what we have here, the highest planet of the chart, is Uranus. And it's at 29 degrees Aries. And it's at the final degree, or what we call the anoretic degree. And there's, at that degree, there's no more power. There's no more energy left in the sign. And, if you th and I, again, I talked a little bit about this today. If you think about, like, when Uranus and Aries happened, it came on with, a, like, a bang. You know, Uranus and Aries happened right, right around the same time as Fukushima. You know, that's when... Uranus changed signs. It went from Pisces, water, to Aries, power, explosion. It was synonymous, right? Synonymous with Fukushima. And then for the next seven years, what did we see? Aries represents the individual. And what we saw was the radicalization of the individual. And, the ra and Uranus is the ruler of Aquarius, which has a connection to groups. So it was the radicalization of the individual that theoretically would be connected to groups. And what did we see over the last seven years? Well, we saw the radicalization, Black Lives Matter, people being woke, people being red-pilled, right? Antifa, LGBTQ, yeah. you know, you had uh, Me Too, you know, you, you, you had, uh, you know, the QAnon. I mean, everybody is waking up. Everybody had an issue. Everybody wanted to, you know, you know touch the lightning rod and be empowered, and then hook up with people that theoretically were, were similar in some ways. Well, we went through seven years of that. And then Uranus went into Taurus, and immediately when that happened, Hawaii started to blow up. So, you know, it left Aries. And now it's back again, and it's like, how much, how much energy do we have left to get into that kind of radical self-expression? Well, this is the last stand. This is the last stand. It's election night in the next couple of months. And then at the beginning of the year, Uranus goes back into Taurus, and it won't be in Aries for another 74 years. Okay. Actually, sometimes well, 84 years. 84 years. So it's a long time, right? This is it. And on election night at 11 o'clock, it's at the hour strikes midnight, right? It's right at the top of the chart. So there's, think there's, there's no energy left. And yet there's this kind of radical insistence that something happened, that something changed, that something gets done, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you go over here and you look. I'm thinking, about Don, part, Lemon. I've been thinking about Don Lemon last week saying we have to do something about white men. Yeah. That's yeah, that's like a 29 degrees Aries thing. Ah, okay. Because Aries also, you know, one of the words associated with Aries is Aryan, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's going to come up as part of the language around this. And, but here, I, I, the other thing that's really fascinating for me, you know, being in a white body in this lifetime and having to go through certain kinds of things that are associated with, you know, my pigmentation, my age, all these things, right? It really interests me to watch what's going on. And there's a part of me that understands it as a social program. And as a quote unquote, so-called white male in this lifetime, I actually find it to be completely abhorrent or aberrant, abhorrent more than aberrant, right? I do. But if I was, if I was typified 
with any other race or color, I react the same way. You know, and if I if I was a so-called black male and the same thing was going on, I'd, I'd have a similar attitude. It's just the way it is, right? And, but I think what's happening, and this gets back to what you were talking about originally, Randy, about the segmentation. And the segmentation, the message that keeps coming through is that everything that's wrong has to be pinned on the shoulders of the white male. This is what's been taking place. And there's the guiltification factor. I mean, all these things are going on. But I will tell you, I will tell you that that message is starting to kind of run dry, just yeah. like a lot of these yeah. other messages yeah, mm -hmm. are starting to run dry. Yep. Like when we have a false flag now. We're running out of like, male privilege quickly here. You know, people are like, oh, another false flag. Okay. Right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. so this is what's going on now. And, 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 and when we get to this Uranus and Aries, the 29th degree, especially goes back to 28, there's going to be kind of a last push for some kind of vilification, you know, some kind of like, you know, radical dispensation of, you know, you know, the, the crimes of the century, or the, you know, or the crimes of the planet or, or whatever, you know, and we're going to see this getting played out. And eventually the energy around all of it is going to go away. It's going to go away. Now, these people who are creating these new ads that we were talking about, which is the new tribalism, that's Uranus and Taurus, by the way. Taurus is very tribal. It's Earth-oriented, Earth-centric. So the idea here is to kind of um, either radicalize, empower, or create groups that are actually, you know, um, sort of the embodiment of diversity in a very direct kind of way. You know, and so we're going to see some of that. It'll be interesting, but the energy around this whole um, electrification of the self, which is what Uranus and Aries was, is dissipating. It's, it's kind of gone. Mm. It, and it's, but, but election night represents kind of the apotheosis of that. And I don't think it's going to go well in some ways. You, you know, I feel like that the energy is radical. Like it's right up there at the top. You think it's radical. Riots? Yeah. And if you look at over here, you'll see that the nodes are shifting on election night. So we, we've been in basically the nodes, which are the ascending and descending plane of the moon. Uh, the, the, uh, the node, the north node slash true node has been in Leo. And Emily, you and I talked about this on our little mashup around Joe Rogan uh, mm -hmm. versus Alex Jones. Yeah. Alex Jones, Joe Rogan, they're, they're born 100, at, what, 182 and a half days apart or whatever. Yeah. Joe Rogan, August 11th, Alex Jones, February 11th. And we saw Alex Jones basically take a massive tumble and fall, South Node in Aquarius. And the, the South Node was right around his sun, by the way. And so was Mars, I think, when he started to go through all that shit during the summertime. And Joe Rogan, the Leo, his sun ascended. So Alex Jones' sun set, Joe Rogan's sun ascended. And we went through all the stuff with children pedophilia, the border, kids getting separated from their families, all this stuff with children around the true node and Leo, okay? That's shifting now. For the next roughly year and a half, it's going into cancer. And the amount of emotion that we're going to see, like starting tomorrow night and moving into the weeks ahead is going to be significant. Like, I think people are going to have a very hard time emotionally because what we have here is we have a T-square, excuse me, between Uranus and that true node. And um, somebody's going to be happy and somebody's going to be very unhappy. Now, there could be some very interesting election rigging stuff earlier in the night. Uh, there's some weird stuff going on with Neptune. We also have a square with Mercury and Neptune right here. You know, what does Mercury represent? It rec represents like records, tabulation, facts, figures, correct? And with a square with Neptune, things aren't right. Things do not look right. They don't, don't feel right. So I guarantee you, um, whoever is going to be on the short end of the stick, they're going to cry that, that elections were fixed. You know, this is going to be a big deal. You know, Neptune represents, in, to a large extent, you know, either deification or some form of sacrifice, some form of uh, um, um, uh, 
which we call it a crucifixion. So when we have a Mercury-Neptune square like that, it's kind of a big deal. And so a lot of people are going to be emotional, number one, and then not everything is going to be clear. There's not going to be a clear story. There's not going to be a clear narrative. There could be a lot of confusion. You well, have I, a lot would, of I would say there's one factor here that once the smoke clears off of this election, there are a number of issues, the border aside for a second, that's got to be dealt with. We don't have a budget right now. We haven't had a budget since September. And the fact of the matter is, there isn't even a budgetary cliff anymore. These guys are out of money. And they're going to have to do something. I've had two intel sources tell me that after the election, all bets are off. This thing is either going to go tits up or somebody's going to pull a rabbit out of a hat. So I would say that either way it goes, this election is a harbinger of what lies ahead and it looks economic. Yeah, I would, I would, I would agree with you. And I've, I've been reading a little bit about what you, cause I, I think you, I think you popped that on Facebook and I started to look at it a little bit. I mean, clearly we could go into an economic tailspin. I, I have no, I, 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 you know, I have no problem. I mean, I'd have a problem with that scenario, well, but I, I could see that happening. I, I think that once again, we're past this election, you know, there's a lot of sword rattling towards the Federal Reserve right now. And we've not seen this since Kennedy. And I'll just say, uh, parenthetically, that it's a dangerous move. It's a brave move to even rattle a sword towards the Fed. But the fact is that it's entirely possible that the emperor has no clothes and that somebody's going to pull off the illusion in a way that's going to be very shocking. Any type of revelation of illusion about our financial system is a collapse by definition because it's all held together by perception. But it's, all, it's nothing but perception and agreement. Yeah. Yep. So I just I mean, wanted I, to put that in there because the gonna... that goes for the government as well. It only oh, exists of course it because does, yeah. people believe in its authority. Yes. So as soon as people stop believing, that you know that, that that government is God or government is king or that the Fed actually you know is part of the you know any of this stuff it all collapses. It's all about people's perception of power and authority. Yeah. Well, keep in mind we'll have fifteen thousand troops circulated on the border. Exactly. Mm. That's going to change the complexion of things completely. Maybe th maybe that that's what the racial epithet. For. Maybe that this migrant caravan is the story to bring troops to the border to actually, ha that is really troops circulating for what we're talking about right here. Could under be. the cover of border protection from the migrant. Category. Always remember, I mean, look, yeah. if, if you- Good thought, Emily. If you wanted to um, take out probably the, the most well-armed state in the country, in the world, you would come to Texas. That's right. That's right. And putting fifteen thousand troops on the border of Texas could mean a whole With different. The Supreme thing. Court predisposed towards tribunals and an economic system that would suddenly become extremely cannibalistic overnight. Uh, there's a lot of motivations that thread out into this. We're dangerously close to a 90 minute hour here, and I don't want to uh -huh. give that much away, so. Okay, um, I just want to say here. real quickly. Go, please. I, I think in order up. for, for uh, us to wrap our head around the economic thing, we probably have to try to figure out how Wilbur Ross and Steve Mnuchin think. Mm. Because well, those, the, yeah. those are the two guys that are gonna be yeah. the architects behind anything yep. with the economics. Mm. And I have right, no so idea how they There are some other players in the background, I suspect. But Wilbur Ross is a very key yeah. figure. He's a big deal. Um, I was watching, by the way, I was watching Mike Pompeo yesterday. What is up with that guy? I mean, it was like, it was, he was weird. He was answering questions about like North Korea or China. Or, He's the head of the CIA now, right? No. 
No, he's is, the secretary of, what is it? Is it uh, not the defense? He's the, he was the head of the CIA. He's not the head of the CIA. Right. Anymore. He's secretary of state? Yes. Yeah. Secretary yeah, that's right. He switched. I remember now. Oh, like that guy is really odd. Like his energy is so odd. And I'm watching it. I'm like, <clears throat> like, is this the best and brightest we have? It's just weird. It was like, mm -hmm. uh, it's just an aside. It, it just, he weirded me out when I saw him yesterday. Is he human? I don't know. He certainly <laughs> didn't weird me out. Well, you have to wonder about that. And you have to ask that question a lot. Um, Robert, right, can so you tell people, where, wait, before we go, Robert, tell people where they can find you and what's going on with you. Uh, RobertPhoenix.com. It's my website. Um, and I do a lot of stuff on YouTube. I have two channels, 15 Minutes of Flame. That's 15 Minutes OV of Flame. And then um, 11th House, where I do like a lot of astrological stuff. Facebook. There you go. That's where you can, you can catch Robert and I together regularly on our new show, Matrix Mash, here on Off Planet Media and also on his channels. Yeah. And we're yep. loving doing that. We get to a lot of pop culture stuff on that, which is fun. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this was your extended first hour, the public mm -hmm. hour. We'll be back in just a few minutes for the Got patrons. It. Come see us on the other side for an in-depth discussion on the many-tiered deception of the SSPP, otherwise oh. known as the SS Poo Poo, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're going to break out the blue chickens in the next hour, folks. Not really. And we're going to get some astrology, yeah. See you on the other side. Hopefully, come and join us. Patreon.com forward slash Off Planet Media. I'm Randy Moggins with Emily Moyer and our guest, Robert Phoenix. And uh, tune we'll in. Back. All right, I hit pause. I'm going to stop. Okay. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com.